National Weather Service confirming it was a meteorite that flashed over the sky in the Midwest early this morning. Susanna Song joining us live from Chicago's museum campus with that story. Good morning, Susanna. Good morning, Lionel. Imagine a rock the size of a car falling from the sky. Well, that's what many of you saw. A meteor that was traveling about 45,000 miles an hour and then exploded about 10 miles up into the sky and then fell into the water in Lake Michigan near Wisconsin. In a rare convergence of elements, a prenumbral lunar eclipse, a full snow moon, and a comet will all be on full display in most parts of the world. First up is the eclipse, which will present itself as a darkening of the moon as it passes through the weakest part of the Earth's shadow. Prime viewing is at 4.43 p.m. Pacific time, and will dissipate until it completes. Comet 45P is next, and although it's been visible through telescopes for weeks now, it will be at its closest point the morning of February 11th. You won't be able to see it with the naked eye, but should see it in the constellation of Hercules through either binoculars or a telescope. A powerful earthquake in the southern Philippines has killed at least six people and injured nearly 100 others. The earthquake measured a magnitude 6.7, according to the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology. It shook the country's southern region late on Friday. The quake's epicenter was close to the city of Surigao at a relatively shallow depth of 11 kilometers. Hundreds of residents fled to safety as buildings were damaged and power supply was cut off. Officials say nearly 100 aftershocks have been felt. Schools have been used as evacuation centers for those affected. Now, in really rather worrying news, a cleaning robot sent into Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant had to be pulled out from its mission due to technical glitches most likely caused by ultra-high radiation levels. Based on analysis of images from the robot-mounted cameras, the radiation reading inside the number two reactor at the number one nuclear plant was 650 sieverts an hour. During a similar probe late last month, Tokyo Electric Power Company estimated the radiation in the primary containment vessel to be 530 sieverts an hour. The robot entered the reactor on Thursday for the first time since the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami to inspect and clean a passage before further examinations. Despite the absolutely off the charts figures which can kill a person almost instantly, TEPCO officials insist radiation is not leaking outside of the utility. In New Zealand, more than 300 whales have died in what's being called one of the country's largest known strandings of whales in years. It happened at the popular holiday destination of Golden Bay. Rescuers tried to help more than 100 whales return to sea, but around half got stuck again. The bay's shallow waters make it difficult for the mammals to get back. Next tonight here, the major concern near America's tallest dam, a giant hole in the spillway, is growing in size tonight. Here's ABC's Neil Karlinski. Tonight, officials in California have the nation's tallest dam under a microscope, worried about this massive hole that's formed nearby. The Oroville Dam holds water back from Lake Oroville, now at record levels and in danger of spilling over after a series of storms. The 200-foot-long, 30-foot-deep hole is enormous, dwarfing the engineers who climbed in for a look this week. It eroded through the concrete spillway used to release water and keep the lake from topping its banks. This is a big deal. We're very concerned that uh, we manage this properly to protect the public down below. 
Here's the problem. If the spillway can't release enough water now, officials will have to try a never-before-used emergency spillway. We're monitoring 24-7. If any changes occur that could result in any kind of danger to the public, we will immediately notify the public. The Orville Dam are expected to hit record levels right now. Water continues to gush over this damaged spillway. Reporter Sean Bennett is in Butte County with more. What a difference a day makes. Yesterday, we could actually see where the erosion took place, and we could actually see the rest of the spillway. Today, you can't even see it. Now, that water rushing right off to the right side of the spillway on top of the actual hillside and those rocks racing down into the river. Now, history will be made at Lake Orville Dam this weekend, according to officials with the Department of Water Resources. The water level is expected to hit the 900 foot capacity in the early morning hours of either Saturday or Sunday. Now, the DWR officials say it will likely go over the emergency spillway, something that's never happened in the 48-year history of the dam. Now, back in 1997, the water came within a foot, but never actually went over the emergency spillway. DWR officials say crews are working to clear debris ahead of the water spilling over. Now, the hole in the spillway continues to grow. Engineers say they plan to continue using it to lower lake levels. Geographic data says California will have a mega flood about every one to 200 years. So we're overdue, long overdue. In the San Francisco Bay Area, there are over 350,000 people that live in the 100 year floodplain. And I'm sure the vast majority of them don't realize that they're living uh, in an area that's at risk. Losses could be over $700 billion, leaving millions homeless. And it's not just rainfall. Coastal flooding could crumble the Bay Area's outdated levees, leaving safe travel and clean water a distant memory. The Pew Research Center says only a third of Americans say that being truly American means following the Christian faith. The study showed that 32% of Americans say being Christian is very important to national identity. More Republicans were reported to say Christianity is essential to being truly American, while 29% of Democrats agreed. Could hypnosis settle your problem child? CBS 2's Suzanne Marquez shows us the trend some say may be going too far. Your eyes begin to get very tired. Ten-year-old Eric Ferrer Alfaro is about to be hypnotized. And close your eyes when you're ready. He has ADHD and struggles with focusing in school. His mother doesn't want to medicate him, and so far, nothing else has worked. I'm hoping for the teacher to not call me anymore. <laughs> Everybody calls me hypno mom. Hypnotherapist Lisa Mackenberg says she's hypnotized close to a thousand children, including her own. I started hypnotizing the children at seven months to sleep quickly, calmly, soundly, and deeply all through the night. She says that she's essentially teaching Eric to hypnotize himself. Breathe in the word focus, exhale on the word powerful. When he needs to curb his impulses, all he needs to do is breathe in that power word and it resets the neurons. I hope it'll help me because tomorrow I'll have a lot of division and a lot of tests on math. But not everyone agrees that hypnosis is the answer. It's a very risky thing to do. Psychologist Dr. Sanam Hafiz says putting kids in a trance is going too far. The idea is not to gain control of your child's mind, but it's to teach them what's right, what's appropriate, what's desirable, so they can then have control over their own mind. That show was so much fun. For 15-year-old Tyler Reed and his friend, 18-year-old Colin, I don't think so. the road to true self began with family. <laughs> but the journey for these transgender teens also includes exploring medical options to transition. I really look forward to facial hair and uh, my voice being lower. Like, help close this gap between um, uh, how I feel inside and how I look on the outside. And we have some questions. To do so, families work closely with gender therapists. You have to like tell them like what's going on in your head and a lot of the time you don't even know. And doctors like Carol Malazzo, who was among the first in the Sacramento area to treat children diagnosed with gender dysphoria, born one sex but identifying as another. 
a person's gender identity is pretty much fixed by the time that they're three years of age and there's no way that you can actually change them. The pediatrician recognized the need for trans youth more than a decade ago and to date she has cared for hundreds of young patients. California is a hotbed for one of the fastest growing crimes in the world sex trafficking. It's the second largest underground economy in San Diego, pulling in profits of almost $900 million a year. It's a business so big that law enforcement is welcoming the help of private investigators who have one thing in common. They're all former special ops. This team is trained to track. If we catch them outside, extract, to get some audio, and get out without anyone knowing they were there. These are former Navy SEALs, cops, and British Special Forces, now working as private investigators going to, the target. to help rescue victims of sex trafficking. They're so well trained to blend in on surveillance because you know what they do when they're on the SEAL teams is they basically kidnap people. Joseph Travers, a former police officer, started Saved in America, bringing in men with special skills. Every night in San Diego County, there's an estimated 2,500 kids who are missing. And the clock is ticking for each one of them because it's a race between those trying to rescue them and those trying to trap them. Tonight's goal for the rescuers, a teenage girl will call Kylie. Like 80% of all local sex trafficking victims, she's American. Copy and position. Kylie is 15, a year younger than the average age of a girl caught up in trafficking. We think, from the intelligence we have, we're trying to take her south of the border. Intelligence taken from the web and revealing her possible whereabouts. Okay, guys, there's movement in the front window. Law enforcement called in. PD's been notified. The ghosts back out. 10 4 copy. And Kylie is rescued, one of 26 teenagers in 26 months saved by Saved in America. The humanity the humanitarian aid industry has a sexual assault problem and doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. Lots of industries have the same issue, but the humanitarian community doesn't seem to be recognizing it as much. The research says female aid workers are most frequently assaulted by male co-workers and superiors. It also says those assaults are underreported and women who do report say they lose more respect than their assaulter. LGBTQ aid workers say they face threats and are harassed because of who they are. Most aid organizations don't have policies on how to respond to sexual assault or how to prevent it. That can mean a few things. Victim blaming can happen, there's not enough training and enforcement, or there's no clear way for survivors to document an assault. This once grand park, Pedion 2 Arios, has become notorious for its night trade. Young male refugees gather in the shadows selling sex and drugs. This man was in the Afghan police force. His two brothers were killed by the Taliban. He studied law at university. Now he sells sex. When did you decide that you would have to sell sex to survive? When they finish money, I try to find one job. Every, for example, every day, 10 euro if I can find. Never I do this, but a lot of time about this, before days, I try to kill myself here inside this park. When I go, for example, I die. I, I swear I, I cry. During the day, it's a different scene. Refugees are sharing the park with Greeks, walking their dogs and jogging. Many Greeks have become used to seeing so many foreigners in the city. Ever since the refugee crisis started, people have done whatever they could to survive. And for some refugees, that means selling sex. What's different now is the number of people involved and the fact that it's becoming more organized. Violence has erupted on the edge of Paris and spread to at least five nearby towns amid a public outcry over the alleged rape of a young black man by police. Several nights of clashes have broken out after four police officers purportedly forced a 22-year-old man to the ground, beat him, and anally raped him with a baton at a housing estate in the northern Paris suburb of El Nusse-Bois. The officers were suspended pending an inquiry into accusations that they used excessive force while arresting the young man during an identity check last week. Il prend sa matraque et il l'a enfoncé dans les fesses volontairement. Justice! Porteo! Justice! 
Qu'on arrête de dire que nos enfants sont des dealers. Les policiers n'ont pas à faire leur propre justice. A wave of violent crime continues in the Brazilian state of Espiritu Santo, where police have gone on strike. Despite the presence of 1,200 soldiers and federal police officers, with more on the way, the state is still racked with violence. Vitoria, the urban state capital, is usually patrolled by around 1,800 police. Officers went on strike over a four-year-long salary freeze. According to the police union, over 100 people have been reported killed since the strike began on February 4th, putting the daily murder rate six times higher than average. It is also estimated that businesses have lost almost $29 million since the strike began. Meanwhile, schools, businesses, and public transportation remain closed. Representatives of the police met with state officials on Wednesday and demanded that every officer's salary be doubled. A spike in murders in Brazil as soldiers patrol the streets in Esperanto Santo State. More than 100 homicides reported in just six days after police walked off the job, demanding better pay. Schools and shops are now closed. Public transportation ground to a halt as the military tries to contain chaos. Some citizens are running scared. My father is coming to pick me up. I'm leaving. I won't stay here. Most of the violence is happening here in the state capital, Vitoria, a wealthy port city ringed with golden beaches. But normally crowded cafes are now empty, with visitors staying away amid security fears. There's been a drop in customers and we've also seen problems with trying to leave certain areas. There are no buses, there's no security for getting home safely. Business is complicated. Brazil is in the midst of an economic crunch, making it tough to keep even basic public services going. There are now fears the strikes could spread to other states struggling to pay their police. A collapsing currency has led to economic anguish in Venezuela. Sky-high inflation has caused prices to double every 18 days. And citizens line up to exchange money that is almost useless. Inflation has totally ruined us. You'd think this cash is enough to do things, but it's not. It's worth nothing. These bills are devalued. In Venezuela, where an estimated 110,000 people in 2015 were living with HIV, a shortage of critical medicines, including life-saving anti-HIV drugs, threatens a country already in crisis. In June of 2016, a network of Venezuelans living with HIV sought urgent humanitarian aid from the Geneva-based Global Fund to Fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. The petition notes that in addition to a severe stockout of antiretroviral treatment, Venezuela lacks a necessary supply of condoms, HIV test kits, or basic supplies to diagnose and treat tuberculosis. The Global Fund leaders, who notably took six months to reply to the original urgent request for help, have responded that they have liaised with our partner network to see who might be in a position to help. Lots of kids hate vegetables. Now, children in the Eurozone may be in luck. There's a vegetable shortage rolling across parts of Northern Europe, making it harder for shoppers to get their hands on fresh produce. Veggies like spinach and zucchini started vanishing from grocery store shelves across Great Britain in early January. Four of Britain's biggest grocery chains have even started to ration iceberg lettuce. Meanwhile, broccoli, cauliflower, eggplant, peppers, and cabbage are in short supply in Denmark, France, and the Netherlands. Bad weather in a corner of Spain that supplies much of Europe in the colder months is largely to blame for the shortage. In Germany, the price of fresh vegetables jumped more than 18% in December. The UK grocery chain Sainsbury's is charging around 175 for a head of lettuce, more than three times the price in pre-shortage days. A plague of vast proportions. Countless locusts have swarmed Bolivia, causing the government to raise the alarm. We have declared a state of emergency. We have decided to issue a supreme decree. The arrival of these unwelcome visitors happened a week ago near Santa Cruz. 
they've already wiped out almost 1,100 hectares of corn, peanut and soybeans. Authorities are warning that the locusts could destroy the country's main agricultural region, which supplies more than 80 percent of Bolivia's food. People are very scared here by the locusts. These bugs have done a lot of damage, eating all the production of maize, beans, squash and watermelons, also yuca production. All this production was destroyed. The government says fumigation must begin straight away. Pesticides are being sprayed on the ground and in the skies. But even with all these efforts, the locusts are spreading quickly. The question is how much damage will they do before they're eradicated? An invasive caterpillar species is spreading across Africa and devastating crops. The fall armyworm, native to North and South America, appeared in Africa for the first time last year. Scientists say it likely arrived on commercial airliners. Non-native armyworms are now spreading rapidly. They've already been confirmed in countries across Southern and Western Africa. They pose a major threat to agriculture. Maize, an important staple across much of Africa, is especially vulnerable. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says fall armyworms have destroyed up to 73 percent of crops in some areas. Fall armyworms are also difficult to control using pesticides. In a statement released Monday, February 6th, the Center for Agriculture and Biosciences International said the caterpillar could, quote, spread to tropical Asia and the Mediterranean in the next few years. The United Nations says it is ready to support Kenya after the country declared its drought a national disaster. The U.N. statement came Friday, the same day Kenya called for aid to counter the current drought. The Kenyan government said over 2 million people are in urgent need of food assistance. The U.N. Food and Agriculture Organization warned the country is facing a severe drought and with it rise in a food insecurity. The drought has affected 23 out of 47 countries posing a major risk to people, livestock and wildlife. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta called on all stakeholders to support the government by upscaling drought mitigation programs. In drought hit Guatemala, those taking a swing at farming are coming up empty. The little that grows here is simply not enough. And it's worrying World Food Program officials like Gustavo Alas. They have had losses from 80 to 85 percent of their basic grain, he says, which is the main crop here, so they do not have the necessary food in the season where they build up their stock. Three consecutive years of El Nino link drought have exacerbated poverty and hunger in the country of 15 million. The World Food Program, or WFP, says the European Union will invest $4.2 million to support families most affected by droughts including subsistence farmers like those here in Guatemala. The investment aims to improve land productivity and food security, though WFP recognizes despite the intervention, 5 to 10 percent of farmers and their families will resort to immigration. In this remote village, images of dusty paddocks and flies buzzing over carcasses. And not far from here, a herder is watering his animals, trying to salvage what remains of his herd as a devastating drought continues to displace thousands in several parts of Somalia and Ethiopia. These displaced families shelter under this